Hello, welcome to this session on turning curiosity into real world business growth. I'm Michelle Perry Slater, and I'm really pleased to be able to facilitate today. A really interesting discussion is coming up for you. I hope that you've been having a wonderful time joining in the Learning Technologies Autumn Forum this year. I can guarantee that this conversation that we are about to have will get a bit spicy, a bit lively. We've got time at the end for questions, so please get over to the questions section and keep them coming. We'll hold those to the end, um, but we definitely would welcome them. Who have we got today talking about turning curiosity into real world business growth? Well, we've got Alexandra, known as Ali, Ali Wilson. She is regional sales manager at Cornerstone On Demand. And from a degree in journalism, um, Ali has now got years of experience shaping learning and uh, technology and delivering workforce development and business values. Now, a little fact about Ali, she's got an outside pizza oven. We're in the UK now. The weather turned one week ago. I'm not sure that you're going to be using that pizza oven for a while, but I know that you love to cook and bake. So let's see what you can cook up for us today. Joining Ali is Dominic Holmes. Dominic is a principal strategy and value uh, uh, international expert at Cornerstone On Demand, a highly experienced management consultant. Um, got a lot to bring to us today with over 20 years of documented success, shaping and delivering growth across that broad spread of industry and clients, entrepreneur, oh, I can't even speak, entrepreneurial startups and uh, scale ups as well, all sorts of different businesses. So a lot of experience that we can learn from. One thing we will learn straight off, of course, is Dominic does his best thinking whilst walking the dog. As if on cue, there is a dog barking, so that's excellent. Um, dogs are welcome in our session today. Um, we all do our best thinking in different places. Now, what best thinking have these guys brought us today on this session? Over to you, and I'll join you at the end for all of the questions our audience will put into the questions and chat. Thanks very much, Michelle. And um, it's interesting, I've just learned something about my colleague. I too, Ali, have a pizza oven. We'll have to catch up on that um, afterwards. But um, as we, uh, we kick off the session today, I want to start by just running us through what we're going to, to cover. And Ali's going to start by talking a little bit about the pressing challenges, first of all, in the industry, but also in the wider business environment. And ultimately the focus of that will be, why does this matter? Why is it important right now? Uh, I'm then going to share with you um, some latest cornerstone research, which is really gonna highlight what high performing organizations are doing right to accelerate the rate of learning and skills build within their organizations and how they're ultimately turning that into business growth. I'll then pass back to Ali, who will talk a little bit about how we pull together connected systems of delivery and spend a little bit of time giving you some insights into the latest work here at Cornerstone. I'll then try and uh, wrap that up because we're going to be covering a lot today. We're going to be going at pace um, uh, and then ultimately show how we can turn, well, first of all, how we can ignite curiosity, but then I'll, how that ultimately leads to what matters to business leaders. And being business centric is very important right now uh, and ultimately delivering what business leaders need, which is growth. Hopefully we're gonna pull up with about um, 15, 20 minutes to spare. Uh, Michelle has promised us that there's going to be a lot of challenging questions to answer. So we're really looking forward to that. So I think at this point, I'm going to pass over to you, Ali, to sort of give us an introduction into what's happening out there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dominic. And uh, nice to virtually meet everyone this afternoon. Uh, as with ever, we're working from home, so I think my dogs are protesting the fact that they're not allowed in the room. They still decide to have a bit of a bark in the background to give their view of uh, emerging technologies. Um, so I do apologise if, if that does come up. So what we're going to do to start off with, to set the scene for the webinar, I'm going to start by talking about some of the pressing challenges that we're seeing in the industry today. And I'm sure a lot of you are also having a little, you know, seeing within your own workplaces. So 2023 has been a real turbulent year for HR leaders and had a significant impact on that world of work. Business leaders everywhere are prioritising their transformation. 
it's now more important than ever to plan for change, so to really elevate your organization's performance. We read about how the tech sector alone is facing over 180,000 job cuts this year, how the unemployment rates dropped to 4.2%, leaving us with a smaller than ever talent pool. But on the flip side, there's a huge amount of employees that are considering changing their role in the next 12 months, creating larger gaps in organisations who were already struggling to hire and retain the great talent that they've developed. So while the visible talent pool was small, that hidden talent pool was huge. And just in the news this morning, I read the likes of uh, Nokia are looking to cut up to 14,000 jobs in the next three years as they begin to realise that they'll need to streamline their own processes um, as companies continue to adapt to the ever evolving digital landscape, Nokia being one, Amazon um, and other organisations as well. We are witnessing a digital skills crisis and what's core to an organization's ability to adapt and be future proof ready is our ability to have a strategy and capability in place that enables us to focus on workplace skills and skills competence. Skill sets are always changing and no industry or specific job role is immune to this. So from our recent survey, which Dominic's going to be going through a little bit later, we found that 72% of CEOs see upskilling the workforce as a high priority area which is also uh, backed up by a recent Wall Street Journal in which CFOs cited their number one concern is of hiring and retaining qualified employees to support the workforce of tomorrow. Now, AI is, is all around us and ChatGBT has hugely changed the world that we live in, where AI can both impact, but also support an organization's cur curiosity. We're seeing it every day. Um, it's, it's on a swap card, which we're having a look at in regards to people that are similar to us, people that are in similar roles. But we can really use this to help develop the skills of our pre people and also get that additional leverage in regards to our curiosity and how we're going to be getting into some of these emerging technologies into the future. And it's not getting any easier. What we found is that organisations are still in that discovery and build phase of having the right skills led culture to learning and development. And with that expanding adoption of AI, this is going to become a significant and influential factor in the future of jobs. We're seeing that 90% of leaders believe in the need to embrace their frontier technologies and 75% are planning to adopt frontier tech within the next five years. But a, spent, uh, a percentage of these companies still aren't yet ready to embrace these emerging technologies. So what does this mean? Basically, we have high hopes to embrace these technologies, but organisations aren't yet ready for the change. So what, what does that next step look like? There was a really interesting report from uh, the World Economic Forum in the Future of Jobs report, which is discussing workforce strategies. It's definitely worth downloading and have a look at that. And what we saw is that 81% of organisations are investing in learning and development on the job, which of course is no surprise. But to frame this, 44% of workers' core skills are expected to change in the next five years. And um, we were recently speaking to one of our clients who see the technical skills of their own IT developers are going to need reviewing every 18 months to ensure that their teams are working in the right way. And I'm sure a lot of the uh, everyone in the audience might also be thinking the same in regards to the evolution of the skills within their organisation, how they're going to develop the skills of their people for today, but also over the coming years as the world continues to evolve and, and change moving forward. Now, right now, organisations are investing in building skills and looking at ways to retain the great talent that they've built. But, but despite, despite all of that, 26% are thinking and looking at their next job. And of that 26%, only a third are looking internally. Now, this could be because of a number of factors, but also what does that awareness look like across the opportunities within the organisation? And is there support from above in regards to how they do mobilise, how they do get to that next career move? So what we're thinking about moving forward is how are we going to support that internal mobility to reduce the attrition and um, increase the amount of mobility that we've got within the organisation? What I'm going to do now is hand back over to Dominic, one of our principal consultants, and I'm going to get his view on how the market's doing in addressing some of the skills builds and how we're going to be addressing and build, bridging some of those gaps at the same time. Dominic, over to you. 
Thanks very much, Ali. Um, so for me, what you've just described is almost like um, the perfect storm. Um, innovation is the fastest it's ever been ever been, but also the slowest it will ever be going forwards. There's a lot of business uncertainty out there, and we have this game changer uh, that is AI. C-suite is focused on building skills, but despite all of the investment that's going into those building those skills, there's this increasing what we would describe as a hidden talent pool, uh, people with itchy feet uh, looking to find the right opportunity. Um, really to deploy the skills that they're developing and turning those into capabilities. Uh, as I'm sure many of you will know, um, Cornerstone um, is a global business um, with a very sizable client base, which puts us in a fantastic position um, to get some real insights uh, from the marketplace in terms of what's happening. Um, that's why we have our People Research Lab. Uh, and that's been a global multi-year investment for us. Now that started in 2020 with the, the Global Skills Re Report. And what that report um, unearthed is even back then, there was what we call a skills confidence gap. So put very simply, if I um, ask uh, employees, how well do they think um, their employer is doing in terms of getting them ready for the future of work, they'll have a view. Um, if I ask the same employers how well they think they're doing, they'll have a view. And it's by comparing those two is what we refer to as the skills confidence gap. Well, back in 2020, um, our global skills report revealed a 30% gap between employee uh, perspective and that employer and um, you know I think what's interesting is since then um, certainly skills uh, if you look at Gartner research uh, back in 2022 it was the number one priority so as a business uh, and looking in we're certainly expecting things to change um, but what we did when we repeated the research in 2021 is we added in organizational performance and uh, the key thing about that is it's not organizational performance from the point of view of how proficient the hr the talent the learning team are but it's it's a business assessment uh, and what we were looking to do is understand how did the skills confidence gap change if we were able to separate the data into high performers and the rest well, back in 2021, uh, what our, our global skills research showed is there is a marked difference between the skills confidence gap for high performing organizations compared to the rest. That gap dramatically reduced to near a 6%. So clearly high performing organizations were doing something different. So wind the clock forward to today, 2023, we've run that report again. This time we're calling it the Global Talent Health Index. Why is that? Our sole, well, not our sole focus, but a major focus for us is if that skills confidence gap remained, we wanted to be able to drill down and understand what high performing organizations are doing differently um, so that we could really share that with the marketplace and we could all learn uh, from their success. Uh, in order to do that, we, we introduced seven key dimensions and I will, I'll, I'll make us familiar with those uh, in a minute. But before I do, I think the first thing we need to look at is, did we still have that skills confidence gap? And much to our surprise, it has remained uniform across those key pieces of research. It's very, very stubborn at around 30%. And given all of the focus that Ali was talking about, independent research carried out by Gartner, we found that really surprising. So, you know, we were very keen uh, to sort of use our new talent health index to drill down and find out what these high performing organizations were doing differently um, to, to close that gap. 
And, you know, Ali made a really interesting point, you know, about the hidden talent pool, only 33% of people looking internally. This is a significant challenge because ultimately employees have become really aware coming out of COVID of the importance of staying current, how quickly you need to perhaps learn to stay and remain current. Um, so ultimately, if you're looking to address that um, hidden talent pool, getting alignment between how well your employees and the employer think you're doing is business critical. So what we're now looking at um, on screen is those seven key dimensions where we've broken down um, the data to fundamentally understand uh, the difference between how high performers called leader in our graph um, are doing and compared to uh, the rest of the market, which are named laggards in, in our index. And I think the first thing I really want to, to draw our attention to, and to be fair, it comes across a little bit uh, more easily when you're studying the difference, the, the data, is the three areas where fundamentally high performing organizations are doing relatively better. First of all, they have a skills strategy. What does that mean? For me, in the simplest way, it's as well as focusing on what needs to be done, we're also starting the conversation about the best way to do it. We're looking at the how as well as the what. Um, in addition to that, they were focused on content strategy. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that some more towards the end. But ultimately, uh, to use one of Ali's analogies, is um, you need books on your bookshelf if you're going to get people read on your on your bookshelf if you're going to get people reading, and it needs to be the right books. Um, the third point is talent mobility. I think uh, Michelle touched on this earlier with her, her great introduction where we talked about lattice style career moves. Um, ultimately, in the, you know, I think we've all moved to flatter organizational structures. With that, people are looking for always fresh challenges to perhaps leverage the skills and experience that they've brought together to deploy them in practice. Um, and as I would say, the world of work um, becomes more broad, um, there are new channels opening up and people naturally want to explore those. So they are what we call the high performing organization power plays. They're very much, they're, they're where they're focused. And why are they so um, powerful? Well, another area of our research sort of looked at what employees are saying that they wanted. And number one was additional skill development content. You know, basically two thirds of, of the employee service, uh, surveyed wanted that additional content. Secondly, they were looking for what I would describe as coaching and mentoring. And, you know, I can remember the first time that I was given a mentor um, quite early on in my career. And that was transformational in terms of helping raise my profile within the business, but also accelerating the rate at which I was able to learn. Third, but only just behind, is basically that tailed and comprehensive career guidance. Why is that? I mean, fundamentally, if we wind the clock back, um, say, 20 years, um, career paths were very, um, I would say, prescriptive. It was quite clear about what your next move was going to be. You know, I was talking to a client um, just yesterday who is fundamentally opening, uh, you know, four additional lines of business as they look to grow. Well, what does that mean uh, for their existing workforce? There are four additional essentially businesses within that group that could be the right place for me to go to help me take my next step in my learning journey. Now, if we quickly superimpose, if you, you see what those employees are saying they wanted and where high performers are doing, uh, are pushing slightly ahead of um, the rest of the market is there's this obvious sense of alignment between where they are pushing 
uh, the envelope slightly in terms of their learning and talent strategy and what their employees want. They've got very strong, what we call alignment. If we dive into that a little bit more, if you look your way around um, that, I think they're called spidergrams um, or radargrams, but um, across the visual we've got on screen. High performing organizations aren't just doing better in two or three of those seven key uh, dimensions to talent health. They do well across, they do relatively better across all seven. So we call that a balanced approach to accelerating their learning. So as well as being aligned with what their employees are prioritizing, they are also balanced in terms of they are universally stronger across those seven key areas uh, to talent health. I think what's interesting as well as looking at that relative strength, it's sort of where are they investing? But the, first of all, to safeguard that advantage, uh, but also to accelerate it. Um, and these are the four key areas um, that um, we identified in our survey. And I think many of those will look very, very familiar. Um, naturally, um, AI is going to be involved. Why is that? For me, I think it's really, really simple. Um, as we look to do more, um, unfortunately, doing more needs, means doing more often with the people resources that we have. So if we're going to, if you like, uh, move our talent performance to the next level of maturity, um, we're going to need some help to do that. And AI is fantastic at helping with some of that heavy lifting. I think sat alongside that is, you know, 85%, 85% of high performing organizations are leveraging tools and technology to streamline that flow of learning in the flow of work. So we're going to touch on it in a bit. But, you know, if we think about how and where we learn, bringing that talent experience to that point of need is critical and high performing organizations are leveraging tools and technology to help them do that. I think for me, we've already touched on the importance of skills, you know, as well as focusing on what needs to be done, how we get that done. For me, the really interesting one is knowledge networks. Um, and ultimately, I think a lot of us uh, are familiar with the power of social. And I think it's how uh, we're bringing that consumer grade social experience into the technology that we use is fundamentally critical um, to building knowledge networks inside our business that, again, we can leverage to help drive commercial advantage. And then for me, there's the last uh, but probably most critical uh, thing that we found out, and that's that high performing organizations have broad initiatives uh, as they look to drive their learning and their talent maturity forwards. Now, what do we mean by that? And I think, you know, Josh Burson has, has touched on it uh, with his connect with, with, with his view about um, the future of talent. And it's about rather than looking in those silos, if we think about the spokes on those seven dimensions of talent health, when businesses and talent leaders are looking to drive progress, they're looking at what they need to do in each of those seven areas. So if you like building out from that balanced approach uh, to form what we call a connected approach. So ultimately they are doing three things and you know, easy to remember acronyms are always useful. And for us, it's ABC. And that's what really defines what high performing organizations are doing. And it's all about aligning to the needs of their employees, being balanced, so being stronger across those seven key dimensions. But critically, as you look to progress to the next level of maturity, uh, achieving a level of connection with your initiatives across those seven dimensions. So, you know, we, we refer to that as ultimately delivering a connected system of development, a connected system of delivery.
And if we just quickly compare that thinking with how that combines with what Gartner is telling us um, as leader priorities for 2023, I think we see some fantastic alignment. Why? Well, interestingly, although it's quite small on the screen, number one in 2022 was building skills. And I think what we're now seeing is rather than uh, being a focus as a standalone um, if you like, area, it's now being baked into everything we do across learning, performance, talent, personal growth. If we look at where they're focused now, it's sort of number one, two and three are leader and manager effectiveness, organisational design and employee experience. Now, interesting, if you look at the three boxes that aren't coloured, um, so the white boxes, for me, they very strongly align with the areas that are, I think are showing us as next for development. So, you know, that's probably where we're going to see when we rerun this survey um, that high performing organisations are starting to push out, having already done a great job of covering the three that employees are, set, are, are saying are priorities. So ultimately, what are we saying, you know, and what are we saying uh, to the audience here? It's really simple. Do what high performing organizations do. Make it work with an ABC approach. Align, balance and connect. The great thing is um, we're not the only people that are saying that. You know, one of my favorite quotes from Joss Burson, he talks about companies needing an AI powered to help us with the heavy lifting, skills-based system, so we're focused on the how as well as the what, across those key dimensions, uh, really to drive organizations to outperform their competitors. So at this point, I'm gonna pass over or pass back to Ali. Uh, Ali, can you perhaps sort of share some of the thinking that you need uh, to sit behind building your connected system of delivery and perhaps share some insights around where Cornerstone are focusing really to push that agenda. Yeah, absolutely, Dominic. And that was really interesting in regards to what you're what you've just gone through, um, what high performing organisations are doing, how they're adapting to the changing world and some of the stats as well, which I'll, I'll reference later in regards to what employees are now looking for. So to put that into perspective in regards to what does you know, what is a connected system of delivery? What does that look like to support the emerging technologies that we're seeing in, in today um, from a cornerstone perspective? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the three guiding principles that we see and um, kind of go, go from there, basically. So everyone will be very familiar with this. This is our traditional 70-20. 70 20 10 model in regards to how skills and capabilities were supported when they ran a study back in the 1980s 70 percent of that was through on the job experience 20 percent through informal learning and 10 percent through formal learning but actually when you think about it how does that correlate to what we're doing in the 21st century how are we going to transfer that into the systems that we're using to support that 70 20 10 model and there's absolutely going to be a revival in the boardroom in regards to what that model is going to look like so uh, going through the first area so as we look to accelerate the pace in which our workforce is addressing skills we see that businesses are looking at where they need to do more. So a learning management system is typically going to sit under that 10% of formal traditional learning, where someone is uh, going to have to complete learning based on their role, based on what they need to do to get to that next step, the mandatory learning to ensure that we're compliant. But for that remi remaining 90%, we need to think about what are those building blocks going to look like to address the full 100% of, of where we see the 70 and 20. And this might be seen through the areas such as social and self-directed learning. Now, where we see this fitting in is, is it's given rise to two new, two new building blocks in today's world of emerging technology. 
The first of those being the pool aspect of a learning experience platform. So this part of the 20% is targeted at addressing the informal learning, which happens when we're interacting with our peers in the workplace, but it also is going to support my own individual development. So that's my individual uh, informal aspect. That then leaves 70% to look at our, our own on the job experience, which is what we would see as learning in the learning in the flow, our third building block. And this gives people the opportunity to turn those skills into capabilities in a workplace context to then develop their own individual career path. So traditionally, on the job experience would be seen as someone going into the office and, and doing X, Y and Z. But in today's world where everyone is virtual, remote, we're all over the country, we need to look at alternative ways of how that um, job experience might be supported and the evidence that you're going to get from that at the same time. So this gives a bit more of a modern take on how we see the 70-20-10 model being supported um, in today's world. But obviously really interested to hear everyone's thoughts at the end and, and their ideas on that as well. The second theme is in regards to redefining relationships and how that's going to be done using the you, me and we mindset shift. And I don't know if many of you have come across this before, but the way we see that is the you, which is the corporate strategy in regards to based on the business needs, what do I need to do in my role? So relating to that almost 10 percent of formal learning, the me, which focuses on my own individual empowerment in regards to what learning and development do I need to do? I want to do to support my skills growth into the future. That is another selling point for why I want to be with that organisation. And then that third, that third pillar is the we of collective intelligence in shaping that best practice to then create value as a team to harness the skills and capabilities in the business. Um, and, and really, me is in the middle. And without that, there is no we in creating value as a team. So we need to be able to ace that in regards to how we're supporting those three pillars of, of relationships. Now, the, the final theme for today is content which we see as the key to democratization and the way i like to look at it dominic stole it earlier is in regards to um you can't do much with an empty bookshelf so how best can we fill those shelves to support uh, us mobilizing into the future so traditionally we would see this coming from areas such as premium bought content free to use material which you might have surfaced from the web what the market's beginning to realise is that this can only get you so far in accelerating the pace of learning to meet us where we're at in our journey. And where we see you getting real impact is our need to involve our subject matter experts in the organisation in filling those shelves with the best books and a blend of premium plus consumer grade learning to get that momentum for the next generation of authors. So we're utilising the knowledge of our peers in the organisation to mobilise into the into the future. Um, and referencing back on one of Dominic's slides in regards to what employees want, we saw that 65% of employees want to see additional skills development content. And that might be from their own peers that are actually producing that material rather than it coming from above. So how can we support more of a, a bottom up approach rather than top down? Now, having taken on board these three guiding principles of what good looks like in technology to build a connected system of delivery, we wanted to put together three key areas that we're focused on at Cornerstone in how we look to push our market leading proposition forward. So for us, there's, there's three key elements. It's about being stronger together. Now, what this means is to bring our talent into a single joined up proposition to deliver that golden thread of learning, talent and experience through one comprehensive system. The second is through getting that single pane of glass across that golden thread. So it needs to be presented in a together way that provides that visibility of all areas across the organisation that relates to an individual to close those gaps, but also help that individual me broaden my experience and take my capabilities into the future for that unified experience. The last is real data and that supportive help. So utilising AI to support some of that heavy lifting in making sure that we as talent professionals are driving our strategy forward and that our data points 
provide the proof in driving the journey to where we want to be on that spill, skill spectrum. We all expect data points and it's, it's going to be a real key catalyst in understanding what, what we need to do to get to that next area. Um, and really these are three, three key areas that we see are, are pushing us forward with what Cornerstone is doing in that tech space. Now, before I hand over to Dominic, what we wanted to do was just provide a, a screenshot basically of what we see that pane of glass looking like in practice. And this is an example of our opportunity marketplace where an individual has the ability to look at themselves within an organization. This individual, for example, is a product designer and look at what that next career move looks like. So how do we reduce churn within the organization? How do we support internal mobility? And this could be through a variety of ways, but actually giving them visibility of what does that next career move look like? What skills do I need to do to become a senior product designer? Um, what paths do I have in regards to going on that? Is that through an AB? Do I have to go through multiple roles? But also like we're referencing as well, what skills do I need to get to that next step in, in my journey, basically? Um, so that's kind of a really interesting take on, on what that looks like. Now, Dominic, uh, what I'd like to do is, is hand back over to you for your, your key takeaway from today and um, hear, hear your thoughts and opinions. Thanks very much, Ali. And um, I think, you know, we've covered a lot um, in quite a short period of time. And I think I'd just like to quickly recap that um, before we go into the, the Q&As um, or, or the discussion, really. And I'm really looking forward to that particular point. Um, and, you know, for me, it's we've talked a lot about skills. We've talked a lot about capabilities. Why does that matter? Um, and for me, it's all about comparing how things were to how they need to be. Um, and, you know, for me, if I look at a lot of the conversations I'm having, um, the focus of C-Suite has moved very much from optimizing our business to how do we accelerate innovation? And that makes complete sense because ultimately the future of world, the world of work is gonna look very, very different. Therefore, achieving that level of agility uh, is really, really key. Um, next, sat alongside that, we're moving from stability to uncertainty. Um, there is so much source of uncertainty uh, in the business world. And, you know, we touched on the news earlier. You just need to spend 10 minutes looking at the news, 10 minutes speaking to, to, to exec leaders to understand just how much that uncertainty makes planning businesses really difficult and in the absence of uh, being able to plan with the certainty that they used to have what they're looking to create is a more robust business and fundamentally learning new skills and capabilities at pace is one key way uh, that they can build an organization that's robust to meet the future head on whatever that future may 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 bring the other thing is, um, as we move essentially from optimization to uncertainty, it's really, really hard um, to be as prescriptive as we have in the past. But, you know, as Ali was sort of showing, is that's kind of OK. Um, there can be lots of different pathways uh, for businesses to go forward. And corresponding to that, um, there can be lots of different ways for us as employees uh, to fulfill our potential. But the key to that is ultimately moving from being prescriptive to being what we call descriptive. It's time to focus on purpose. It's time to focus on outcomes and ultimately democratize some of that responsibility in terms of how we get there back to the power of the crowd and our workforce. You know, we've talked a lot today about uh, a journey, a journey for learning, how that needs to be aligned to the needs of the employee, the aspirations of the business. And we spent a lot of time uh, sort of hopefully highlighting uh, what high performing organizations are doing, the three key frameworks that we have behind our thinking and some of the latest work that Cornerstone have done really to unlock learning at the pace of innovation and uncertainty. 
But interestingly, with all the conversations I have, that tends to be just one of the three aims, as well as learning more. It's kind of um, common sense, but sometimes overlook is we need to retain more. So as well as looking at how we're going to equip our workforce with new ways of doing things, it's important we remember and can lock in the knowledge that we've gained because what's really important is often for global organizations is unlocking or taking that innovation that must be that may have been discovered and built out in one particular geo and quickly directing it to the next geo that's ready to absorb that knowledge and turn it into business advantage the last thing and ali touched on it with so well with you me we and i love i love the phrase there is no we without me and ultimately it's crowdsourcing growth so ultimately if you like um, the inspiration for growing our businesses going forwards is no longer the domain of the few it has to be the domain of the many and ultimately emerging technologies really has to look at how it is enabling that power of the crowd to help drive businesses forwards you know, I think it's always good to try and break down any sort of transformation down into uh, some bite-sized chunks. Uh, here are the often the four steps that we see uh, a lot of businesses aligning with and looking to, to take the next step on. So the first one we've touched on a lot, skills, focusing on the how as well as the what. Um, you know, that has come through strongly in all of our research all the conversations we have with business, all the thieving, uh, thinking from you know, leading analysts such as Bursin, you know, it's really important to focus on skills, the how, as well as the what. Well, when we're focusing on the how, it's really important to understand what the needs of the business are today and what the uh, current uh, skills that our, our, our workforce have. There's gonna be some gaps. We need to understand those gaps and then really use what Ali talked about in terms of a single pane of glass for all the key stakeholders involved in closing those gaps to close those gaps at pace and scale. Then it comes on to really that quick um, insight into opportunity marketplace that um, Ali shared, you know, as well as having the right people with the right skills, you need to get them in the right place at the right time. And that's what agility is all about. And that's very much a prime focus for opportunity marketplace, getting the right people with the right skills in the right place. And that's really critical in the, in, in the current uh, economic environment where there's so much uncertainty and businesses are looking to build resilience, agility, is how you build that resilience. Last of all, we talked about democratization. It's going to be impossible um, to micromanage our way to growth uh, through such challenging circumstances. So that democratization um, is really a key enabler of the future of work. And ultimately, you know, I sometimes get asked, why is that? Why is democratization just so important? And I just share this simple flow with you, really. And interestingly, I too was watching the news this morning, Ali, but I got distracted um, by an advert and um, it was for a large retailer. Um, and they were talking about um, a journey their employee had been on, where ultimately she had unlocked curiosity um in her future career and how that and enabled her to take at least one step up in terms of her career path but i found that really interesting because this slide deck was pulled together before i'd watched that advert and really what democratization leads to is curiosity you know where can i do what can i do how can i do it better and that that is the key step ultimately to really empowering the creativity, the creativity of the crowd. And when you bring that crowd together, they then um, will ultimately discover new things, new ways, new knowledge. And then ultimately, if you've got your right, the right technology framework in place, um, you're going to be able to scale that discovery into innovation, 
that will lead to market disruption, and that's ultimately growth. And growth is what business leaders are interested in. That's what gets them uh, to focus, really focus, get behind what you're trying to do with learning and talent. Now, here we talk a lot at Cornstone about business centricity. And in some respects, there's so many key takeaways today. Um, I am going to sort of say this is particularly important. You know, we've all got ambitions about how we want to drive learning forwards, take it to the le next level of maturity. If I had one single bit of advice for, for the whole audience, it's business centricity. Focus on what the business needs and when it needs it, and then really align one of those key themes from ABC. You know, align what you're doing in talent to really talk to, show how it's going to create value for what the business needs from you today. Um, clearly, if we're going to unlock democratization, if we're going to get um, some disruptive thinking going, um, that's a familiar concept, actually. Um, it's entrepreneurialism. It's entrepreneurialism at scale. The key thing is some entrepreneurs can be difficult to manage. And I think really I would set that step back from that and say, actually, um, you've got to get the culture right. Um, to basically deliver this entrepreneurialism at scale. And for me, that brings us back to probably three of the biggest corporate governance agenda items that we've covered. I've just talked about the importance of culture, but actually health and well-being need to sit right alongside that. You know, for me, these corporate values have just become mission critical as we look to accelerate the world of learning, look to bring our workforce into a future of work that is going to be more challenging. It is going to be more rewarding, but it's also going to be more demanding. The last thing I would say, perfection is the enemy of progress. I love this quote um, because in some respects, this talks directly to me. I spend far too much time trying to perfect things when actually good enough is good enough. And, you know, I know a lot of practitioners wrestle with some of the terminology um, that we've covered today. That's the great thing about AI. Um, AI is great at um, bridging the gap between perfection and what's good enough to deliver that progress. And for me, that's the real power of AI in terms of how it can fill in the gap. So we don't always need to be quite as perfect as we've looked to be in the past. So at this point, I'm going to pass back to Michelle. Hopefully we spark some questions from the audience, Michelle. And um, Ali and I are both really looking forward to doing what we can to try and answer those. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I've got pages of notes in front of me. I love that we're in a digital setting, but uh, my pen has been very busy and I've been capturing thoughts of the chat. So to your point about crowdsourcing and the power of the crowd, I'm going to give a shout out to Teresa, Andrew, Edwin, Fatima, Michael, Kerry, Anish and Liliana for all of the chat. And I know that uh, uh, it's been helpful. They've been helping each other out. They've been giving each other answers to some of the questions, which is exactly what you've been talking about in terms of growth. But before we go to the questions, let's just be clear on some of the terminology. What do you think you mean when you say growth? Do you mean the growth of the individual, the person and their personal development growth? Or are you talking there about business growth? Perhaps you're talking about both and how they interact. Dominic, what's your thoughts there? What, when you say growth, are you specifically talking yes. about business? You're absolutely right, Michelle. For me, it's both. And that's very much what we're, we're talking to with you, me and we. It's about aligning the growth of us as individuals, helping us be uh, the best versions of ourselves. And, you know, the role of line managers and, and equipping that classic line manager uh, employee conversation with a single pane of glass to bring this world of talent together to help them do it is key. But the, you know, the key building or, or glue behind that is very much in terms of helping uh, employees to be the best they can and bringing them together into these um, crowds of talent that have common goals. That's how you drive the business forward and achieve that growth. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's very much bringing the two together. 
So in that, there's something to do with the ownership of the individual and their contribution towards that business growth. There's the the agency that they have when you're providing what you described. I love the way you described it, Ali, the bookshelf. You know, as an author, I'm very happy that you're recommending books on a shelf. But I do appreciate that that was somewhat of a metaphor for the content in its broadest, uh, you know, broadest sense, its broadest scope. Some of the questions that came around at at that point that you were talking about these things were from Michael talking about, you know, the digital divide. How do we overcome the digital divide? Edwin was wondering about how do you link organization reward and that confidence gap? So there seems to be something in separation in the growth of the individual and the growth of the, the business potentially being separated. And I'm just wondering, what would your response be to to somebody like Edwin there who's saying, you know, should we be linking reward, the growth of the business uh, to the growth of the individual? You know, as the uh, we, one rises, we all rise kind of thing. What, what are your thoughts? Ali, have you got anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I absolutely see a correlation between what reward and business growth. And I speak to a lot of organizations and for some, they've got the reward which is very closely linked into aspects such as badging rewarding their people because you know we've got a goal of an organization and if our people are aligned to that we are only going to be more successful so i definitely see a really good correlation um between the two and if we're not akin to our organizational strategy then our people just they're not switched on in regards to the way that we're moving forward um dominic i don't know if you've got a, a view on that as well no, I, I agree, Ali. I mean, the, the, one of the key lines I like, and I think it, it might have come originally from Accenture, is what gets measured gets done. Um, and actually, I would extend that to actually it's what gets rewarded gets done. And um, if we're only going to reward um, rearward facing performance, then ultimately it's going to be really challenging to get employees to invest in developing the skills they need for the future. So, you know, my personal view, and I know others uh, from the conversations I have, are really starting to thinking about this. It's reward models probably are going to have to be realigned to sort of look in both directions, looking back and looking forwards. So typically, you know, reward packages can often be a mixture of individual and company rearward facing but actually they're going to have to start to reward investments that employees are making um, in terms of uh, being ready for the future and interestingly i think you know it's important to look at reward in its broadest sense you know it doesn't just have to mean about the pounds in our pocket you know Um, and i think uh, that's where actually bringing in clear messaging around the purpose of the organization, making sure that purpose is, uh, you know, a recognized and positive purpose and connecting those people to their role in delivering that purpose is going to be very key. So for me, absolutely. And it it broadens it. Actually, we could have another hour's conversation, Michelle, (laughs) on on some of the thinking around that. So what you're what you're talking about there is is what can we do to look forward? Now this again seems yeah. to be a disconnect in the questions that came through. Kerry was talking about struggling with engaging senior leaders in learning. Now that is very much that kind of oh learning happens over there, something happens over there, and and you know that that becomes whose responsibility? You know, go to the L and D team; they'll give you something which is really interesting when you consider your skills confidence gap, because you were really clear on there being a 30% discrepancy between what the organization thought it was providing to what the individuals actually perceived to be the truth. Now we've got this sort of sense of of a question from Kerry there. How do we engage senior leaders in L&D? Because the senior leaders have probably got their heads a little bit in the sand if they really think that, you know, they're doing the right thing, except, the, you know, the why is, why is there such a big gap? Why is, why is it that people aren't getting what they want? You, just, to, just to wrap up what seemingly is a long question here. You, at the very beginning, Dom, talked about a perfect storm. The C-suite are investing in building skills. And I'm wondering, 
Are they, have they got their head in the sand? Is the sand falling through their fingers at speed? Because they're not investing in the agility that you've talked about that we need in order for that differentiation between that gap to actually happen. So what thoughts? How do we engage senior leaders in the realism of an organization, yeah. Dominic? And, and ultimately, you know, although I couldn't spend much time on it, one of, I talked about the one thing that's really important is business centricity, yeah? And the reason that's so important is, in reality, there's competition for investment. Investment's just about money. It's about management focus for lots of different initiatives. And this is where it's really important. And I, I don't want to be too controversial, but, um, you know, it's important to talk about more than learning for the sake of learning. Yeah. And what I find is, to answer the question directly, um, it's really simple. You know, we we often sit down with um, executive leaders, both from the business and from learning. And the conversation always starts about what does business look like for the next three to five years? What do you see as the business journey? OK, and they will always have a vision. And then for me, the key step back is to say, OK, how ready is the workforce? What are the workforce challenges you see in years one, two and three? Critically, where are the risks? And interestingly, they can often share with you how they see the workforce needing to evolve. And then they because they're, they're business leaders, they immediately identify risks. And the key thing is, once you've had that, what we call it a strategic conversation, once you understand what the, is happening in the business and they've told you where the risks are, that's the bridging point to then bring it into learning, yeah? Um, and ultimately look to align initiatives across those seven dimensions that are really going to address those business challenges. So, you know, one of the things we, 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 we often talk about is the importance of putting the business into the business case for learning. Um, so what I would say is, you know, um, ask about, you know, what is our people's strategy? Because that's how we're managing these workforce risks. You know, what do we need to be doing? And interestingly, um, it's, it's again through unlocking that community of learning, unlocking the power of the crowd. Sometimes you'll actually find, actually, do you know what? We should go find out. And that's the key opportunity here, right? For the first time in, I would say, actually genuinely forever, uh, the boardroom door is open to learning and talent professionals. And we've got a choice, right? We can either just quickly walk past, because it looks a bit scary in there, right? Um, or do you know what? We can step in, introduce ourselves and say, look, we've got some great approaches for accelerating the process of workforce development for de-risking business growth. But in order to do that, we really need to have that top level vision for where we're heading. Let's spend some time. There's an interesting question, which is almost a response, even though she asked it before you answered that, um, from Liliana about regularly a person can move from the business area to a support area, but it doesn't tend to happen in reverse. So she asks the question, does mobility apply to all areas and roles of the organisation? And I think you've just answered that as in, you know, push on the door, push on the open door, get the door open and, and you know, be curious um, about that. Now, we've got another question which we can't unpack in the last minute that we've got together, but I want to throw it out there because I think it's a good takeaway for all of us to think about this when it comes to, you know, the, the, this whole turning curiosity into real world growth. Edwin asks about the impact of non-hierarchical structures. So as companies become more fluid, as companies become more open, is there a sense that the future is flat? The future is not waiting to be asked into that conversation that you were just talking about there, Dominic, but actually the future is banging on the door, pushing through and, and uh, you know, looking at these issues that you raised of skills, gaps, agility and democratization. So any final thoughts, literally in our last minute on, does the structure of an organization make any difference to your skills confidence gap that your uh, your research has shown? 
Um, Ali, do you want to take that one or do you want me to, to pick it up? Um, I mean, my, my mind is, is whirring because it's such a great question. And I think, you know, in an ideal world where we see the future of organisation is that it is a little bit more linear in regards to we can have those C-suite conversations, we can talk to our peers. Everyone is very much equal in regards to where we want to go on that skills journey. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've definitely got some thoughts that I'm kind of thinking about. But what, what's your take from a professional standpoint? Yeah, I mean, for me, what yeah, you're talking about is, oh, yes, the rise of the skills based organisation. And that's where actually roles are based around skills rather than the job of work that's got to be done. But ultimately, that's the role of an OMP to open up those opportunities to map those skills to where we're heading. Brilliant. Well done. Well wrapped up. If you want to talk more to Dominic and Ali, um, they have got another session at the Learning Technologies Autumn Forum, um, chaired by the most excellent Claire Doody next week on the 26th of October. So please do uh, attend that as well. But all that's left for me today to say is thank you so much. So many interesting notes, so many thoughts through my mind, and I'm sure the audience is as well. Thanks ever so much to both of you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye.